In the middle of the 19th century, the Ottoman Tanzimat reforms were transforming the empire into a modern state, and finally, a somewhat centralized one. Although many Bedouin and ethnic groups remained outside of their control, they finally exercised some form of control over major cities like Damascus and Baghdad. But it would all soon come crashing down. For starters, they were taking out huge loans that they could not pay back. Their debt actually totaled around 10% of their income, and there was a lot of interest to be paid on these as well. Then, externally, there would be a disastrous war with Russia which tore up the country, and pushed the Ottoman Empire back towards conservatism. Nevertheless, in the 1860s, they were still on the up. In fact, they were doing so well that they looked to expand their empire once again. Like they found an ally in Arabia, the Jabal Shamar Emirate. These were more liberal than their rivals, the Wahhabis, and were more welcoming of Ottoman aid in the region. They were also fortunate as, in 1865, the ruler of the Saudi state, Faisal bin Turki, died. Then, as per usual, a succession war erupted. Abdullah bin Faisal first took over, but he had to fight against his brother, Saud bin Faisal. Abdullah tried to gain protection from the British and the Ottomans. The Ottomans agreed to help, but they took over Al Hassa in 1871. This Saudi civil war continued, though, weakening the state in general. And in 1891, Jabal Shamal would move into Riyadh and exile the entire Saudi royal family. Plus, fortunately for the Ottomans, there had also been other shifts in power in Arabia. Like, Kuwait had long been an independent state growing rich from trade with the British. But in 1866, Abdullah II al-Sabah became ruler, and he decided to shift the entire country's foreign policy completely. So, rather than trading with Britain, he more or less swore allegiance to the Ottomans. Then further south, Bahrain had, just a few years earlier, been recognized as the overlords of Qatar. But the ruling family in Qatar, the Al Thani, began to assert their own power. Clashes began to intensify until, in 1867, the Sheikh of Bahrain, Mohammed Al Khalifa, formed an alliance with Abu Dhabi and attacked. During this attack, they all but destroyed Doha. So the Qataris turned to the British, who disapproved of Bahrain's actions. They agreed to recognize the Al Thanis as the rulers of a virtually independent and united Qatar in 1868. The British would then help the sheikhs of these nations remain in power. Like, in 1895, there would be a rebellion against Sheikh Isa bin Ali in Bahrain. But the British helped to subdue them. Also, in the far south of Arabia, most of modern-day Yemen was still divided between a number of small states. The British did begin making some connections with these states like Mara. When, back in 1834, they agreed that British ships could dock in their ports, but they refused to sell any of their lands. And in 1866, they agreed not to deal with other foreign powers, once again in exchange for money. So they could, in theory, be considered to be under British protection at this point. But first, even though you are all now enjoying some history online, nothing can truly beat the feeling of a historic document in your hands or upon your wall. That's why I'm proud to announce that the sponsor of this video is Historic Mail. This is a service dedicated to connecting you to great events of history through the lost art of letter writing. The concept is easy. Every week an envelope will arrive at your door, and inside is a beautiful reproduction of a letter written by an important historical figure, along with a document providing context and a typed version for easy reading. These come from a huge range of historical eras, from the American Revolution to Churchill's love letters to Clementine. So imagine, if you will, receiving a letter every week from your favorite historical people, stamped and delivered to your doorstep. Or maybe, if you know another history buff out there, this will be a fantastic gift this Christmas. This will give you or them a beautiful addition to your room and a more personal understanding of the people involved in history's most important events. For instance, in the letters between Churchill and Roosevelt, you can truly see the importance of the special relationship between their two countries. Or one of my favorites is Walt Disney's letter to the then Vice President Nixon requesting an interview. With Historic Mail, you can get 10 weekly letters for $59.99, or there's another option for 25 letters or 52 letters if you'd like to explore history for a whole year. And if you do get them as a gift, they will come with a certificate with your name on to make it even more personal. So this holiday season, surprise your history loving friends and family with this timeless gift. And you can even get 10% off on all of their products with their Christmas sale. Just go to historicmail.com slash jabsy to get your gifts now, and of course, support the channel. But for now, let's get straight back to the video. 
A new power had also emerged though, the Gaiti Sultanate. This however had unexpected origins, as over in India in Hyderabad, there had long been a community of South Arabians, known as the Hadramis. These either came as merchants or mercenaries and began to establish trading links across the Indian Ocean and they grew in wealth. The Gaiti family had migrated to India in the early 19th century and Umar bin Awad married an Indian heiress, rose through the ranks and passed on a considerable fortune to his children. One of his sons, Salah bin Umar in particular, began to use this fortune to build his own state and had negotiated for the purchase of Bur Ali in Wahidi country. But they weren't the only ones. The Katiri Sultanate, which had long ruled in the region, began sending their family members to India as well to make some money. Some of these would go even further and create communities in Java, hoping to exploit the lucrative opportunities there. They would then send this money home, along with experienced soldiers. However, in the 1860s, the Gaiti newcomers began to expand, and the two sultanates would continue to fight for decades. British-mediated peace treaties were often broken. Yet, in 1888, the British did manage to sign a protection treaty with Gaiti, but really, their power in this region was limited. To the north, the Ottomans had also been trying to capture Sana from the Shia Zaidi for years, and they were finally able to do so in 1872. From here, they also looked to expand into the small states around Aden, like Haushabi. Back in 1839, the Haushabi had also signed a treaty of friendship with the British. However, the politics here changed quickly. They united with other tribal groups in Fadli and Yafai and attacked the British. In the 1860s, Sultan Ali bin Mana then cut off the water supplies to Lahej, a protectorate of Britain. And yet, another small war ensued. Other states included the Fadli Sultanate, which signed a treaty with the British in the 1830s but they also provided sanctuary to many Yemeni people who had killed British merchants. They'd then take money for peace, but break it shortly afterwards. Like in the 1860s when they plundered caravans outside of Aden, the British would retaliate and, once again, force or pay them to submit. In 1883, the British would actually help them in a war against Olakai, and they finally ended full British protection in 1891. And these were just some of the many states that made up modern-day Yemen. Yet, I'd hesitate to say that they were truly under British protection at this point, regardless of the treaties. But going back to the lands that the Ottomans did conquer, where they implemented what many have called borrowed colonialism. This is a disputed term, but to simplify it, it's the idea that the Ottomans emulated the Europeans to some degree. They continued their policy of turning nomads into farmers, whether through threats or rewards and many in the capital began to look at the various elements of their empire as savage, in need of forcibly embracing civilization. This was therefore the Ottomans' version of the white man's burden. So, in Yemen, the foreign Turkish rulers brought with them foreign ideas, foreign laws, and a great deal more. So, others call this colonialism without colonies. But given the lack of infrastructure in the empire, Yemen was as foreign to the people in Istanbul as India was to the British and they even began to conduct business like the Europeans. For instance, in Yemen, the Sultanate of Lahej refused to sell concessions to the Ottoman Tobacco Company to begin production in their lands. So the Ottomans responded in 1900 by supporting the Humar people in building a fort on the roads to Lahej. This, however, was on the borders of the Haushabi, a fight ensued, and more tribes turned to the British for assistance. Again, though, this is a disputed idea. But it's a simple way of thinking about this period. The reforming rulers of the Ottomans were trying to turn the multicultural population into a nation. A nation with farms, no raids, and a proper infrastructure. In many places, though, people began to fight back. Like it said that in Iraq, this period saw more division between the Islamic sects, as those who rejected the colonial efforts turned more towards Shia Islam, especially among the al muntafiq in the south. And this whole period was somewhat successful. But, as the country began to centralize, the next argument was over how best to govern over the state. Like in 1865, in a forest outside of Istanbul, a group known as the Young Ottomans was created. The few hundred members of this group believed that the reforms didn't go far enough, and advocated for a constitution in line with the European nations. This is simplifying their ideas somewhat, as some within the group wanted Islam to continue having influence on the nation, while others, in their paper Hurry Yet, were far more radical. Most of the leaders were exiled, but they still had some prominent supporters, 
like Mustafa Fazil Pasha, an Egyptian prince. Meanwhile, foreign ideas began arriving in the empire. Like in the early 19th century, Turkic people within the Russian Empire began to call for rapid modernization. These were the Jadid, who also advocated for women's rights, the use of European sciences, and a lot more. They of course also wanted freedom from Russia, and to end this, a new idea of Pan-Turkism began to emerge. This was the idea that the Turanians should unite, but who the Turanians are is still open for debate. This idea was largely spread in the Ottoman Empire by a Hungarian known as Armin Vamba, but the idea also had supporters in Finland as well. So, in short, it was a collection of people who belonged to the same language family. But some writers would include Japan in this group, and others would include the Native Americans as well. Ziyako Kalp in the early 20th century would write a book called The Principles of Turkism, expanding on these ideas. However, some believe that he was actually a Kurdish man, but strangely, he argued, I learned through my sociological studies that nationality is based solely on upbringing. So, in his eyes, Anatolia should and could become a solely Turkic region. This, however, was at odds with the pan-Islamic ideas. This had been supported by more conservative thinkers like Al-Wahhab and even Usman Danfodio in Nigeria. Their idea of pan-Islamism therefore focused more on returning to a glorious past. But there were some modernists as well who believed in this idea. The most important was Jamal al-Din al-Afghani. He travelled extensively throughout the Islamic world, gaining audiences with rulers from Kabul to Istanbul, and he argued that modernization was needed to fight against European colonialism. One of his students, though Rashid Rida, would go completely the other way. He began to believe that unity would only be possible with the restoration of the Caliphate and implementation of strict Sharia law. So, within every movement, there were further disagreements. Outside of the capital, there was also the beginning of Pan-Arabism. However, most of the early proponents of this concept were Christians. Men like Jerji Zaydan, Francis Marash, and Ibrahim al-Yazidji, who called for Arabs to recover their lost ancient vitality and throw off the yoke of the Turks. But their secret societies received no great support. Another early Christian proponent was Naguib Azori, who believed that the new state should stretch from the Euphrates to the Suez, but stop there. As, in his words, the Egyptians do not belong to the Arab race, they are of the African Berber family. There would later be some Muslim advocates as well, like Abd al-Rahman al-Kawakibi. He believed that Mecca should be turned into the capital of a new unified state, and only Arabs could lead it. But the movement never really kicked off. Like the Young Arab Society, which was formed just before World War I, only had a few members. Even later leaders of the pan-Arab movement, like Hussein ibn Ali, showed no real desire to unify the Arab world before World War I. Many of the people within this region were more concerned with protecting their own local autonomy. There were also other ideas taking hold, like Ottomanism. This was the idea that many religions and ethnicities could be unified into a state, where they all enjoyed equality. Although this was sort of the main idea of the empire for centuries, it was unlikely to be accepted by many. The ideas of pan-Islamism and pan-Turkism especially seem to have captured the imagination of many within the capital. So, it was during this time that Ottoman support for rebellions began to increase across the world. Like over in western China, Muslims launched the Dungan Revolt in 1862. The Ottomans sent aid to the rebels and recognized the creation of a new Islamic state known as Kashgaria. But their weaknesses were still pretty obvious. Like in Indonesia, the people of Aceh rose up and asked the Ottomans to help them in a war against the Dutch. But no Ottoman help came. And at the end of the century, the Americans were fighting against the Muslim Moros in the Philippines. But the Americans just asked the Ottomans to tell the rebels to accept American rule, and the Ottomans obliged. While back in the capital, reformers were still in control of the government, like Mehmed Fouad Pasha. He, as a liberal, was particularly keen on keeping Britain as an ally. And, in his words, we should relinquish several of our provinces, rather than see England abandon us. Obviously, this attitude, though, wasn't liked by many. And the power of these reformers were limited anyway. Like Mehmed Fuad died in 1869, and his ally Mehmed Emin Ali Pasha died two years later. 
more conservative viziers would take over next, while the Sultan at this time was Abdul Aziz. He was a bit of a Francophile and in 1867, he became the first Ottoman Sultan to visit Western Europe, meeting the likes of Napoleon III. So much of the reforms made during his time in charge were modelled on the French system, like with their public education. The French were soon crushed by the Prussians in 1870, and across the world, people began to see this once powerful empire as incredibly weak. Like over in Japan, they decided to base their constitution on the Prussian model instead. While as for the Ottomans, they realised the weak French couldn't defend them against foreign threats, so they began to look at appeasing the Russians, or forming an alliance with the new German Empire. This defeat also actually inspired people in Algeria to rise up in 1871, as part of the Mokrani Revolt. Tensions here had been growing worse for a while, but not just between the colonisers and the Algerians, but also between the French settlers and military rulers. Civilian rulers began to replace the military rulers in many of the cities, and they granted citizenship to Algerian Jews. But the real revolt began when the French tried to send Spahi cavalrymen back to France to fight against the Prussians. They mutinied, and Macrani, believing France was now a weakened country, led over 250 tribes in rebellion. The rebellion was subdued pretty quickly, and many rebels were deported to labour camps in New Caledonia. There they joined many members of the Paris Commune that rose up when the Prussians were besieging Paris. As for the French though, their defeat in this war would lead them to seek prestigious victories elsewhere, and they'd begin taking over colonies in the Islamic world. But the Ottomans were also suffering disasters of their own. On the surface at this time, the empire was looking strong, like they had the third largest navy in the world in 1875, but this was all built on loans and in 1873 a drought struck Anatolia, crippling much of their industry, while internationally, the panic of 73 affected worldwide markets. In fact, much like what happened during the depressions of the 1930s, many leaders became more isolationist. Free trade, loans and investment around the world had helped cause the Long Depression, so leaders like Bismarck in Germany, for instance, nationalised the railway lines. Plus, with weakened economies around the world, trade began to drop. The Ottomans therefore had to default on their debts. The Europeans at this time obviously wanted their money back, so later on, the Ottoman Public Debt Administration would be created. This was a huge organisation with representatives from across Europe, all collecting taxes and sending them to the creditors. Plus, then the more immediate crises began as soon as they defaulted in 1875. They looked to raise revenue by raising taxes, but as per usual, this just started rebellions in the Balkans. Many would rise up in Albania and Herzegovina, however, Bulgaria would be the most important. The Bashi Bazouk were sent in to deal with the rebels, but these irregular forces were notoriously cruel, and in Bulgaria, they would commit a number of atrocities. One British eyewitness reported, The number of children killed in these massacres is something enormous. They were often spitted on bayonets. So once again, Ottoman atrocities turned European support against them. This actually had been happening for a while, like in 1866, the people of Crete rebelled and the Ottomans blew up a monastery and the people hiding within it. So the British began to pull away from the Ottomans entirely. Like Gladstone said, The Turks are not the mild Mohammedans of India, nor the chivalrous Saladins of Syria, nor the cultured Moors of Spain. They were, upon the whole, the one great anti-human specimen of humanity. While to the north, the Russians found new allies in Germany and Austria as part of the League of Three Emperors. This left the Ottomans completely isolated, and within the capital, people began to riot. The leader of the young Ottomans had already been establishing links with high up people, one of which was Murad, the nephew of Abdul Aziz. He, by the way, actually joined the Freemasons as well. Other prominent people included Midat Pasha and Hussein Avni Pasha, who had been dismissed as Grand Viziers for opposing the economic policies of the Sultan. They removed Abdul Aziz in a coup in 1876 and put Murad on the throne but it became very clear early on that he was not of sound mind. So they got rid of him in a couple of months and made his brother, Abdul Hamid II, Sultan. Together with the young Ottomans, he introduced a constitution. This should have, in theory, quelled the rebellions and gained support from the Western powers. However, many Ottomans were angry as it went against Sharia law, while many abroad saw it as the last attempt to save a dying empire. By this point, the troubles in the Balkans had intensified as Serbia, Montenegro and other nations 
went to war with the Turks as well. The European leaders met in Constantinople later that year and tried to make sweeping changes to the empire, including the creation of autonomous states in the Balkans. This was rejected, so in 1877, the Russians moved south once again. They had the support of many people in the region, so as they passed through Romania, the people there declared their independence. And in less than a year, they were once again pushing on the Ottoman capital. The Russians, though, committed their own atrocities on the way. Like Itar Manli, they massacred thousands of Muslim refugees. And many Circassians who had fled genocide in Russia were caught up in the massacre as well. Yet this quick advance worried the British so much that they sent their fleet to defend Constantinople and demand the Russians make peace. Russian troops were, by this point, at San Stefano, just a few kilometers away from the city. And there, the great powers met to determine what should happen next. The Ottomans were forced to give away a lot of land to newly independent nations. They also agreed to create a large Bulgarian principality, but many didn't really like this, as it was simply too large. For instance, the Greeks didn't want them to take Macedonia, and the great powers were worried by Russia creating a large pan-Slavic bloc. So Bismarck of Germany hosted the Congress of Berlin in June. This time, the Ottomans found an ally at the conference in Britain by handing over Cyprus to them. This put Britain in a prime position in the Mediterranean, able to control much of the traffic in the Suez. Yet still, it was agreed that the Austrians were allowed to occupy Bosnia, and they would eventually annex this territory in the early 20th century. Otherwise, the Principality of Bulgaria was divided up. This would be quickly reversed, though, as in 1885, they would unify and eventually declare their independence later on. But in general, nobody was really happy with the treaty, and the new borders would be challenged pretty much by every country. In the aftermath of this war, Abdul Hamid began to withdraw into his palace, and, citing social unrest, dismissed parliament. This ended the first incredibly short constitutional period. In his palace, he began to shift towards conservatism, and almost became paranoid about threats to his rule and his country, like he created a secret police known as the Umar u Hafia. They would spread propaganda, discover threats, and report directly to the Sultan. While across the Middle East, the war demonstrated just how weak the empire was, and many terms included in the treaty angered a lot of people. Like over in Kurdish lands, people were angered by the rights given to Christian Assyrians and Armenians. So the uprising of Sheikh Ubaidullah broke out. He, however, was a somewhat complicated character, because he wasn't necessarily angry with the Christians, and issued a fatwa against harming any of them. In his words, the Sultan, has supported the Kurds in every way. It is done because of the desire to counter its Christian elements in Anatolia. And if the Armenians are eliminated here, the Kurds will lose their importance for the Turkish government. But more importantly, he was a crucial figure in the beginning of Kurdish nationalism. Ever since the Tantamat reforms eliminated the Kurdish principalities, the region was in a bit of chaos. Some tribal leaders tried to assert the Ottomans sent troops in, and lawlessness began to take hold in the countryside. Ubaidullah, however, looked beyond tribal differences and said, the Kurdish nation, consisting of more than 500,000 families, is a people apart. Their religion is different, and their laws and customs distinct. We are also a nation apart. So there was a national revival going on among the Kurds and also the Armenians. Both groups had long had a strained relationship, but this was the beginning of some degree of cooperation. For instance, an Armenian man known as Art Sruni celebrated the uprising, saying, the Armenian, Assyrian, and Kurdish populations of Armenia finally are beginning to understand that they are the inhabitants of Armenia, with the same interests, that the oppression of Turkey equally troubles them all. So many new Armenian groups like the Hunchak called for cooperation with the Kurds, while Ubedullah often praised many of the Assyrian Christians. However, it was all short-lived as the sheikh couldn't count on the loyalty of many of his tribal leaders. So he made peace with the Ottomans and crossed into Persia. There, strangely with Ottoman weapons and support, he led tens of thousands of Kurds in another rebellion. The Persians would soon counter and drive him back into Ottoman lands, where he'd be imprisoned and exiled. And Kurdish-Armenian relations wouldn't really mend for some time. Otherwise, as the Ottoman Empire was failing, Many troops were called to the Balkans to fight against the Russians. This meant most of their centralization efforts in the provinces had been reversed. One area the Sultan highlighted straight away was the issue of Armenian lands in the east. The people here had been caught up in a number of conflicts and suffered attacks from the Kurds and Circassians. So when they had their national awakening, they even created their own constitution back in 1876. Plus they also sent Mikotic Crimean to meet with the great powers at the Berlin Congress. 
The Sultan therefore began to believe that the Armenians were almost an extension of foreign Christian threats that, in his words, could get at our most vital places and tear out our very guts. And he was in fact true that they did have a great deal of support from major powers. The Russians after all wanted to protect their fellow Christians, who reported to the Tsar that the Turks were raiding their lands and forcing them to convert. While in Britain, Gladstone said, to serve Armenia is to serve civilization. The Ottoman government, however, was too weak to really do anything about it though. The Sultan couldn't even stop the local Kurdish bandits from raiding Armenian villages. So instead, he just created the Hamidian regiments, which would include Turkmens, Kurds, Arabs, Circassians, and all sorts of ethnicities. But this was just an irregular force that was largely given the freedom to do whatever they liked. The Armenians formed their own groups like the Hunchak, aimed at promoting their cause and defending their lands. And skipping ahead of time a bit, in 1894 in Sanson, the Armenians rebelled. There, they were, however, brutally crushed, and Gladstone gave Abdul Hamid the nickname the Red Sultan for his actions. As the killings continued and no help came, some Armenian militants seized the Ottoman bank to bring attention to their plight, but this just resulted in more massacres in the capital. One American in Erzurum reported, many were fearfully mangled and mutilated. One I saw whose whole chest had been skinned, his forearms were cut off, while the upper arm was skinned of flesh. While in Urfa, an Armenian cathedral was burned, killing 3,000 people inside. These massacres continued for a couple of years, often at the hands of irregular militias, leaving anywhere between 80,000 and 300,000 dead. Hundreds of thousands were left homeless, women were forcibly married off, many were forced to convert, and hundreds of villages were torched. Abdul Hamid believed this solved the Armenian question, but, of course, more killing was to come. Other groups also suffered at this time, like the Assyrians. They were once again stuck between various groups, and to make matters worse, many of the Hamidia cavalrymen were better armed after the war with Russia, as they refused to hand their weapons back after serving on the front. The Assyrians would therefore be swept up in the violence, like at the massacres of Diyarbakir. The Sultan, however, did nothing, so many would later look to forming an alliance with the Russians, like Shimun the 19th Benjamin, the ruler of the Assyrians before World War I. Now though, after all of these atrocities, the Ottomans, who had been saved by the Western powers before, were completely by themselves. Abdul Hamid did however find one strange ally though in Theodore Herzl. In order to advance the Zionist cause, he agreed to publish papers favourable to the Sultan during this time, but he was forced to resign from his leadership position, as many within the Zionist movement disagreed with his actions. But there were also stranger events occurring in Palestine though, which I'll get onto in a bit. First though, after the Russo-Turkish War, the Western powers made huge gains in the Middle East, like in Tunisia. This country was already bankrupt, and loans needed to be repaid. But more than that, the French needed to restore their prestige, and stop the Italians from advancing their claims on it. The Italians had actually been encouraging businesses and migrants to move to Tunisia to further their claims, so by 1881, there were around 11,000 Italians living in the country, which was far higher than the 1,000 Frenchmen. Yet the British didn't want the Italians controlling both sides of the straits, so they made a deal with France. This was pretty much the done thing at the time, to maintain some sort of balance of power. As part of this deal, the French recognised Britain's takeover of Cyprus, in return, the British supported the French conquest of Tunisia. The French then went ahead and claimed that the Tunisians were harbouring Algerian rebels, and in 1881, they invaded. Mohammed III quickly surrendered as the French entered the capital, and his country became a French protectorate. There was a small insurrection in Safax, but this was quickly subdued. Ali III took power shortly afterwards and signed the Conventions of Lamassa. This handed over real power to the French, but on the surface, it was just to give them the power to repay the debts. French troops remained in the country, and the army and police force was placed under their control. But in the countryside though, they still kept much of the local powers in place, and Ali III, for the first time ever, appointed a Tunisian to the position of Grand Vizier, named Mohamed Aziz Boatol. He, however, had to deal with the crisis, as the French took over the concession to supply water to the capital. In response to this, the city's council resigned, and thousands protested. However, the French just exiled many of the leaders, and the Bey could do nothing, so he retreated away from public life, leaving his country more and more in the hands of the French. However, this invasion of Tunisia distracted the French from larger events over in Egypt. There, Ismail Pasha continued to plunge the country further and further into debt, 
sometimes through infrastructure projects, other times because of his expansionist wars. Like in 1875, he moved into Darfur, and then he turned his attention to Ethiopia. Some Europeans and even former Confederate soldiers joined the Egyptians in this invasion, but from all reports, this was a complete disaster because of mismanagement and poor leadership. One of the officers in the army at this time was Ahmed Arabi, who grew resentful towards the leadership and their failures. Plus, while this invasion was underway, it became clear that the Egyptians couldn't repay their debts. So Ishmael sold the Egyptian shares in the Suez Canal Company to the British government. But Britain had also been hit by the Panic of 1873, and they still wanted their loans repaid. An international commission, largely ran by Britain and France, was sent to investigate the country's expenses and govern the finances. They also forced Ishmael to become a constitutional ruler. Many were of course angered by European interference in the country and the disastrous wars. Plus, to make matters even worse, soldiers were going unpaid. So the people rose up in 1879, and the new pro-Western Prime Minister, Nuba Pasha, was forced to resign. He was replaced by Chufik. However, he was Ishmael's son and had no real interest in governing, and his new cabinet changed the course of the country to appease the population. Debt repayment was cancelled, and foreigners were dismissed from the government. France wanted to take action right away, but the British were busy fighting the Boers, so they didn't agree to help. Instead, Bismarck pressured the Ottomans, who still legally owned Egypt, to depose Ishmael, and Chufik took over in 1879. Meanwhile, in the Egyptian military, there was also a great deal of ethnic tension, as most of the high-ranking officers were Albanian, Turkic, or Circassian, not local Egyptian. This, by the way, was also the case in most aspects of the Egyptian society. Plus, the financial situation meant the army was being cut inside, and it left many experienced soldiers unemployed. Chufik, being pressured by his cabinet, also tried to ban peasants from the military academy. However, there were four colonels that used to be peasants, including Urabi. He was imprisoned after protesting, but his soldiers freed him, and he led thousands on a march on the palace in 1881. What's important here, though, is that after centuries of foreign rule, whether it be Mamluk or Albanian, finally local Egyptians were pushing to take over the running of their country. Chufik submitted to Urabi's demands, like he created a nationalist parliament, failed with Urabi's allies, and many non-Arab officers were dismissed. Many foreigners were then attacked in Alexandria, giving the Western powers an excuse to move in and blockade the city. The French left though to conquer Tunisia, leaving Britain alone to take Alexandria. They marched on Cairo, defeated the Egyptians, and Urabi surrendered. Tufik was restored to power, but he had to agree to British troops being stationed in his country. In theory, this was just until the debts were repaid, but this wouldn't really happen. So, Egypt had sort of become a protectorate of the British Empire. However, by taking Egypt, they also took over Egypt's problems. Like in Sudan, a cleric named Muhammad Ahmed claimed that he was the Mahdi, or the Redeemer of Islam and launched a jihad in 1881. He allegedly said, he who does not believe in me will be purified by the sword, and gathered support from many tribes that the Egyptians had conquered, like the Rezagat in Darfur, the Bagara Arabs of the south, and the Beja people. Many were attracted to his cause out of anger against the Egyptians, who were foreigners in Sudan, and their high taxes. These taxes were increased when Egypt fell into debt, and they dispatched the Shakiya people to collect them. They were a warlike tribe, as one earlier report indicated, Shakia are continually at war, their only weapons being lance, target, and saber. Their youth conduct raids, sometimes as far as Darfur. Plus, it should also be said that many were also angry at the abolition of slavery, as it had been the basis of the region's economy for centuries. So influential men like Osman Digna lost his entire fortune and joined the Urabis first and then the Mardists. Plus, the Egyptians, much like the Ottomans, had very little control over the furthest reaches of their empire. Some pashas they sent south, like al Zubayr Rama Mansur, created a slave state in South Sudan. And his successor, Rabi az Zubayr, would conquer lands to the west, creating a huge army of slaves. Well, in Sudan, the Mahdists rebelled just before the British took over Egypt, and the British quickly advised the Egyptians to give up on Sudan. This was especially after some British observed the Egyptians being crushed at the Battle of El Ubid in 1883. To oversee the withdrawal of all Egyptian troops, the British sent General Gordon to Khartoum. He made a lot of mistakes in this withdrawal, like telling tribal leaders ahead of time that the British were pulling out. This just encouraged more people to join the Mahdist cause, but he was also determined to delay the withdrawal, hoping for reinforcements, and his reasoning for remaining could be an early example of the domino theory. As he said, 
The danger arises from the influence, which the spectacle of a conquering Mohammedan power, established close to your frontiers, will exercise upon the population which you govern. In all the cities of Egypt, it will be felt that what the Mahdi has done, they may do, and as he has driven out the intruder, they may do the same. But the city was taken in 1885, and Gordon was killed. Khartoum, which had been built by the Egyptians in 1821, was destroyed, and its population were then either massacred or enslaved. The Mardis forces then went on to attack the Italians in Eritrea, Belgians in Congo, and Ethiopians. They created a permanent state of holy war, and an economy, once again, built on slave raids. This would be a Sufi state though, where all people would have to show their devotion, often by wearing a jibia, which symbolized an ascetic lifestyle. The Mahdi himself would die shortly after the fall of Khartoum, and Abdallahi ibn Muhammad had to fight off a number of claimants to take over the state. But as he began to organize the state more efficiently, this angered many people who wanted to keep their autonomy. Then, in 1895, the British under Kitchener decided to avenge the death of Gordon. Obviously, they also wanted to expand British influence into the region during the scramble for Africa as well. So they built train lines into Sudan and crushed the Mardist a couple years later at the Battle of Omdurman. Some rebels held out like Osman Digna, who fled to Darfur. But the British helped re-establish the Sultanate there, while Sudan was put under joint British and Egyptian control. So, in the late 19th century, Tunisia, Algeria, and the Europeans continued expanding across the region. Like during the scramble for Africa, the Spanish were granted Western Sahara. This land was once called the Land of Dissidents, or Bled es Seba, by the Moroccan Sultan. This was a term used to describe any lands which were in theory part of Morocco, but in reality, they had no control there. Trying to actually pin down what Morocco owned at this point is actually pretty difficult, as many maps and reports in the 19th century have conflicting ideas. Like some show they expanded deep into modern-day Algeria, while some French officers claimed that the people of Tuat had paid taxes to the day of Algiers, and the Moroccans never really had power there. These lands though became a point of issue in the 20th century, and still today, Moroccan irredentists lay claim to huge stretches of lands. But at this point in time, the Moroccan rulers still had very little control over the lands closer to them either. Hassan I took over in 1873 and quickly had to put down rebellions in Fez, which began when he tried to impose a market tax on the people. Otherwise, nearly every provincial leader didn't really pay their taxes. To make matters worse, the French and Spanish were beginning to clash with the Moroccans along the borders, like the French clashed with them in the Goua Valley in 1870. But these clashes were instigated by autonomous Moroccan groups, like the Riffians in the north, or even the Dakawa. This group can somewhat be compared to the Wahhabis or the Mahdists of Sudan. It was created by Muhammad al-Arabi al-Dakawi at the turn of the century, and his revivalist message gained a huge following among the poor. They also began to see the Europeans as a threat, and in 1887, they clashed with the French along the border. In the capital, Sultan Hassan was a very religious leader, like many of his predecessors, but he was too nervous to be dragged into a larger conflict, so he sent his own expedition to subdue the Dakawa. The Europeans in Morocco were also protected by the protégé system, which granted them extra rights within the country, and, obviously, this caused more resentment as well. The French and the Spanish in particular abused this system, but Hassan did have an ally of sorts in Britain, who wanted to make sure Morocco was strong enough to remain independent. The British then managed to get the Europeans to agree to fairer terms at the Madrid Conference. Yet, even the British North West Africa Company was able to establish a trading port in Cape Juby in 1879. This was attacked a couple of times before being sold back to the Sultan in 1895. So, the Moroccans could do very little to stop the Europeans, and they tried to modernize. But to do this, they needed to collect taxes. So, every summer, Hassan would lead expeditions around the country, collecting these taxes and demanding the chiefs wear fealty to him, like in Sousse in 1886. Many of the provincial rulers that collected taxes were known as the Kaids, and they continued to dominate much of the country, like the Glaoui family around Marrakesh. They, through their alliance with the Sultan, would be allowed to expand their domains, launch campaigns, and subdue tribes nearby. Some of the Sultan's expeditions went far into the desert, like around Tuat in 1891, where they hoped to reassert Moroccan control. Although this largely just meant he made many Tuareg tribesmen as Kaids, or tax farmers, on behalf of the Sultan. And most of his modernization efforts didn't go far enough. This was evident as, again, they went to war with the Spanish in 1893. The Riffians again continued to raid Spanish lands, and they captured a Spanish cruiser. The Riff then tried to attack a Spanish fort, but without artillery. 
so this attack mainly consisted of them trying to scale the walls where they were mown down. But the Spanish also couldn't proceed on land, as Governor Margallo had been a corrupt leader, who, before the war, sold weapons given to his forces to the locals. With these weapons, the Rift then laid siege to the Spanish colony. While the Spanish waited for relief forces, they sent convicts out into the countryside to ambush the Rift and cause terror. Finally, once reinforcements did arrive, Spain once again expanded their territory, but only a little bit. Hassan would die shortly afterwards and was replaced by Abd al-Aziz. He was just a child though, so his regent Bar Ahmed steered the country for a few years, subduing the odd uprising and conducting foreign diplomacy. Throughout all of this, yet another scholar began to argue against colonialism and even pan-Islamism. His name was Muhammad Ubda, an Egyptian who, in 1884, briefly published a newspaper called al Uwak al wuthka Initially, he even joined the Freemasons and spoke in favor of unity between the religions, saying, I hope to see the two great religions, Islam and Christianity, hand in hand embracing each other. So the British were initially quite welcoming of him and his almost secular ideals. But then he left the Freemasons after talking to one of his contemporaries, Rashid Rida, who I mentioned before. Rashid was in favor of uniting the Islamic world centered around Mecca. In this world, Sufism would be crushed and the correct version of Islam, in his eyes, would be taught around the world, free from European influence. But this was rejected by the Sultan and his many Sufi advisors. So Rashid began speaking against the Sultan and in favor of Arab leadership. He almost argued along racial lines saying that they were the only people who could lead such an empire. He, like the Sultan, though, agreed on one thing. They were convinced that the Masons were a mere wing of European colonialism. But more than that, the idea that they were part of a wider Jewish ploy began to take hold. Abdu and Rida co-wrote this in the early 20th century. There is no people in the world like the Israelites, in their adherence to their sectarian affiliation and tribal fanaticism. Freemasonry is a secret political society that was formed in Europe. And this conflict between many Islamic and Jewish leaders would only grow worse, as Zionists began encouraging more and more people to move to Palestine. 